if I take two rings and dip them into the bubble solution, it creates this fascinating bubble surface referred to as a catenoid. But what is this so-called minimal surface? How do I mathematically demonstrate the surface that's going to be formed? More generally, the question is, if I take a given boundary and put the boundary in the solution, what is the bubble that's going to be created given that particular boundary? This is the study of minimal surfaces. One of my favorite is when I use a helix and it creates this very fascinating helicoid. Look at that. So in this video, we're gonna study the mathematics of how to derive these minimal surfaces using an incredibly powerful technique called the calculus of variations. Let's focus on the example with two parallel rings. There are many different surfaces which have these two rings as their boundary. And so our bubble question is really asking, which of all of these possible surfaces is the one that has the least surface area? And while you might be tempted by the cylinder, a straight line after all is the shortest distance between two points, there is also an inefficiency with the cylinder because if you could make that middle portion narrower, the smaller circumference in the middle would contribute less to the surface area. So what surface is best? And how can we show that it actually is the best? We can simplify this problem a lot with symmetry, specifically assuming the bubbles will have a circular symmetry, like their circular boundary. If we consider just a curve and say the xy plane, we can rotate that curve around the x-axis to form a surface of revolution. This rephrases the problem as asking what curve or what function f of x when revolved around the x-axis gives the smallest surface area. Now, we have a great formula for computing the surface area formed when you take a function and revolve it around the x-axis. It is just the integral of 2 pi f of x times the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared. The derivation of this formula by analyzing slices is a standard first year applications of integration problem. Up here is a link to a previous video that I've done deriving this surface area formula. It's definitely a fun application, so I encourage you to check it out. And nevertheless, we're just going to cite this formula in our video today. Okay, so our task is to figure out what f of x, what function f of x is gonna minimize this particular integral. And an expression like this is a little bit strange because the input here, the question mark, is this function f of x. If you give me a specific function like f of x equal to x squared, then I can just plug in x squared and its derivative 2x in. And if I compute out that integral, I would get a number provided I specified the endpoints x1 and x2. So this integral expression you can think of as having functions f of x as its input, and then whenever you've input a specific function f of x, the output that you get is a number. And we call such expressions functionals. A, a functional is kind of like a function on function. Its input is functions, and its output here is just a regular old number. In calculus, we're often given a function and then asked questions about that function, like at what point is there a minimum of that function? And we have great techniques in this setting, like taking a derivative and setting it equal to zero to find candidates to be minimums. But now that we have a functional, we have a sort of different type of minimization problem. We're trying to think not for a point, but for an entire function that's going to minimize this functional expression. So we're gonna need a new type of minimization and in this video, we're gonna explore something called the calculus of variations. There's actually still going to be a derivative equal to zero buried in there, it's coming up. But we're gonna to have to do a lot more to answer what precisely do I mean by this idea of minimization and how could I find an f of x that really was the minimum possible value over all nice functions for our functional. We may as well be a little more general than our specific example. The integrand that we have is one example of a broader class of integrands that are called Lagrangians. And a Lagrangian is just some expression that's a function of the independent variable x, a function f of x, and the derivative of the function f of x. 
we have our very specific one that came from our specific context, but we're going to answer this problem in more generality for arbitrary Lagrangians. By the way, many very important and interesting Lagrangians come to us from physics, so this kind of generalization is going to have a lot of different applications. And I'll also note that while I've only gone up to the first derivative here, you could imagine Lagrangians that have higher order derivatives as well, or multivariable Lagrangians with multiple independent variables. This is what we're going to do though in this video. Okay, so what's the big idea of calculus of variations? Suppose I have a function f of x that I want to claim is the minimum. Let's imagine small variations or small perturbations away from this function f of x. The way I'm thinking of this is that if I have my original function f of x, I could choose a perturbation function p of x. In this case, I've chosen sine, and it could be many things, but the only requirement is that p of x is zero on the boundaries because the boundaries have to be fixed. That's the one thing I can't perturb. The edges of the bubble have to be on that boundary. So then I consider a new function g of x, which is the sum of the original function f of x, plus some stretching factor epsilon times the perturbation. And as the animation is just playing out over a range of values of epsilon, you can see how the resulting perturbed function can change. And note that here I can make epsilon as close to zero as I wish. Okay, so I have my integral expression that I'm trying to minimize, and then I have this g sub epsilon that I've defined, f of x plus epsilon times p of x, the perturbation. So let me now just take this g epsilon and plug it in. That is, I'm going to get this expression that I'm going to give the name phi of epsilon, and it's just the integral of the Lagrangian when I plug in g epsilon. If f of x and p of x are both specified here, then I have a specific function for every epsilon that I'm considering. That is, one can compute out the value of this integral and you get just, well, some number. But the number depends on epsilon. As you change the epsilon, the value of this is going to change. And so what is this? It's just a function of epsilon. And that's why I called it phi of epsilon. So now here's the big idea. If f of x is a minimum, then it must be the case that this function has the normal old minimization properties of first-year calculus, its derivative is just zero. If ever this derivative was not zero, then I would be able to change my value of epsilon and get something that was smaller. Okay, so now that I have this function phi of epsilon, I want to take its derivative, I want to set it equal to zero, and I want to see what I'm going to get. Taking the derivative is just, well, I'm taking the derivative with respect to epsilon, but, but how do I do that? Now, to help me evaluate this integral, I'm going to do a couple tricks. If doing integral tricks is your thing, then carry on watching. Otherwise, skip forward to the next timestamp where we get to sort of the big idea of what's going on. Now, the first thing to note is that this derivative with respect to epsilon, I can move it inside of the integral. The integral is an integral with respect to x, and I'm going to have some niceness conditions, which I'm not going to worry about too much on this video on the Lagrangian itself. Note that I have changed my notation from a full derivative with respect to epsilon, which was appropriate outside of the integral. But when it's inside of the integral, the Lagrangian depends on epsilon, yes, but it also depends on x. There's multiple variables floating around, so I'm going to use a partial derivative with respect to epsilon. So we're very clear that this is a multivariable function. Okay, so how do I take the derivative of a multivariable function? I'm going to use a little trick from multivariable calculus, which is the multivariable chain rule. The Lagrangian is a composition here. There's an outside function, whatever the Lagrangian is, and then it depends on the variables x, g epsilon, and g prime of epsilon, which themselves both depend on epsilon. So the multivariable chain rule says the following. It basically breaks the derivative into a sum of multiple derivatives. And if you've never seen this before, I do have an entire video on the multivariable chain rule. You can go check that out if you so wish. But basically, you're just doing the same thing as the single variable chain rule and adding them up together. Now there's multiple outside functions, and so you're just taking the derivative of each of those outside functions and then multiplying it by the derivatives of the inside functions. And I can actually really clean this expression up a lot. The first thing I notice is that x is an independent variable. It doesn't depend on epsilon at all, so this first term is entirely zero. And I have my definition of g epsilon here. It's just f plus epsilon times p of x. 
the partial with respect to epsilon is very simple. It's just going to be p of x. Same thing if I take the derivative, it'd be f prime plus epsilon p prime. So the derivative with respect to epsilon is just p prime. So I can use those pieces of information to simplify my life quite a bit. Now, an important thing, we're gonna be taking the derivative at zero. So I really care when epsilon is equal to zero. And if I go back to my definition of g, this is again, g of zero, which is just the same thing of f of x. And the same for the g epsilon. If I plug in zero here, this is just gonna be f of x. So I'm gonna switch my notation around here, respecting that when I'm doing this at zero, my g epsilon is just gonna be the same thing as f. And likewise, my g prime epsilon is just the same thing as f prime. Now, when I look at this expression, I've got a p of x, I've got a p prime of x. I don't like that those are different. I like them to be at the same level. And so I can take the second term here and I can use integration by parts to take that p prime and convert it into a p. So basically I'm gonna specify a u and a dv and I do the normal sort of integration by parts. I'll just step through the calculation very quickly of writing uv minus v du. That middle term is actually zero Remember the perturbation always had to be zero at the endpoints so that it, it actually didn't change the boundary at all. And so we can get rid of that middle term entirely. But now that I've done this, I can go and put everything back together again. Except I can clean that up even more. I notice that I have p of x appearing at two places. Why don't I pull the p of x out? And now after those computations, we've arrived at what's going to be the key idea that makes everything work using the calculus of variations. Remember what p of x was p of x was that perturbation functions. And the idea was that if f of x was the minimum, then you could give me any perturbation that you so wished. And when you took the derivative at zero and set it equal to zero, indeed, we're gonna set this whole thing equal to zero. And so we have this integral that has to be zero, but it has to be zero for every one of the p of x's. But how could we ensure that this integral always is zero for every p of x? For instance, if the thing in brackets was ever non-zero for a region, a p of x that was very large for that portion where the stuff in brackets was non-zero would result in this really big spike at that location. And so what we can use is called the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations. And it says that in this scenario where you have the integral of an expression times an arbitrary p of x, which is always zero, then the expression itself must be zero. And so we have this, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to f minus the derivative with respect to x of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to f prime. That expression must be zero. And this gives us the Euler-Lagrange equation. And while we're gonna use this Euler-Lagrange equation in this video for our rather specific example with minimizing a particular surface, well, it actually is incredibly powerful throughout a huge range of physics and mathematics. Okay, so let's apply this particular example. Remember, we had a very specific function that we talked about. It was f times the square root of one plus f prime squared. That is, we have a specific choice of Lagrangian. So I'm about to speed run through taking this f, plug it into the Euler Lagrange equations and seeing what f that must be. If you're so interested in checking out the calculations, follow along with me right now or jump towards the next timestamp. Okay, first things first, I can just actually plug it into the equation. So I take the parcels with respect to f and f prime. This just gives me the following expression. It turns out to be quite useful here to sort of annoyingly come along and add an f prime multiplied on both sides, which multiplied by zero is just zero. And the reason this is useful is because, as you can verify if you're so interested, this allows me to clean it up. It's just the derivative of this long expression in brackets still being zero. And I like derivatives being zero because I can always integrate a derivative as zero and that just gives me the expression is equal to a constant. Now it's a big long messy expression with some f's and f primes. I'm gonna solve this for f prime. And so I'm gonna multiply up by my square roots. I notice a couple terms are gonna cancel. And I put this all together for f as c times square root of one plus f prime squared. As I say, I want to isolate for f prime because that derivative is gonna give me something that I can integrate. So I'm gonna rearrange this to isolate for f prime. And then I really want to think of f prime as like the derivative of f with respect to x. I'll, I'll switch notations. And the reason for this is I'm gonna put everything with respect to f's on one side. I'm gonna integrate both sides. 
and I get that the integral with respect to dx is this integral entirely in terms of f's and df's. Now, do you remember your first year calculus? This integral might be one that you recognize. It turns out to be the inverse of hyperbolic cosines. And I have a couple different constants. The c from our first integration a little earlier, and now a second constant, d. If you prefer, I can solve for f and rearrange it and I get a hyperbolic cosine expression. And so, after our little bit of technical computations, this is the f of x that we get. Now that we have computed out that our hyperbolic cosine expression is the thing we're looking for, we need to match it to any particular pair of given circles. And we have two constants c and d in our expression, and we're trying to go through two points that hit the boundary, and so we have a shot at it, at least. I'll just numerically approximate for now to get a curve that both matches the boundary and was indeed of this hyperbolic cosine form that satisfied the minimality constraint. If you have two circles that are different sizes, we can play with that d slider, which is, is the offset of x in the formula, and here again we're able to match it. But we can't always match it. If the circles are too small and too far apart, then no values will match. It's kind of a little bit like pulling our catenade so far apart that in fact our bubble is going to pop and we're just going to get two flat disks. And so there we have it, this catenoid, which is just a hyperbolic cosine that has been revolved around the x-axis, forms the minimal possible surface area going to be able to connect these two particular circles. We saw at the beginning of the video that different boundaries create all sorts of different minimal surfaces, and in fact there are many cool surfaces that extend beyond at least my bubble making capabilities. So truly we've only minimally scraped the uh, surface of the topic of minimal surfaces. Now this video has been my submission to the Summer of Math Exposition 3, which is put on by 3Blue1Brown and Leos OS. There are really so many fantastic math explainers that have been released as part of this competition. I'm going to put a link down in the description, so I definitely encourage you to sort of spread the love of checking out some amazing math content. If you have any questions or comments about this video, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.